Hello and thanks for joining us at interest.co.nz. I'm Janae Tijdrani and today my guest is Reserve Bank Chief Economist, Jung Ha. Good to see you remotely, Jung. <laughs> Good to see you as well. <laughs> um, the Reserve Bank Governor Adrian Orr last week said that the bank would need to see significantly different levels of demand for the Reserve Bank to change its mind. Um, or to change tack, I guess, from, from the, the position that it um, laid out in its uh, monetary policy statement. Jung, how different are we talking? Or, or put it another way, how bad would this outbreak have to be for the Reserve Bank to drop its tightening bias? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. And, and part of what Adrian um, was, was reflecting on in terms of the monetary policy committee's thinking was, with the position we're in now going into this lockdown feels quite different to where we were um, 12 to 18 months ago. Um, back then we were sort of staring into this huge pit of uncertainty. We just, you know, we were really concerned about um, how the economy would, would recover, um, how households uh, would respond. Um, there were no vaccines in sight. Um, you know, fiscal policy hadn't yet made its move. So where we're sitting now is that we, you know, we've learned um, a lot, even though this lockdown feels just as uncertain in terms of duration and, and of course, Delta being a lot more um, contagious and, and transmissive through the community. Um, we know the policy responses are effective and they've been rolled out again, particularly fiscal policy. We know that um, households by and large have been willing to spend um, once we come out of lockdown, um, subject to confidence being maintained, health balance sheets and businesses have been by and large um, more than happy to keep uh, workers um, attached to, to their jobs. So that's, it, you know, it's quite a different field this time around, even though we're just as uncertain about how, how long this lockdown will last for. So, you know, that the starting point for monetary policy is very different. So you'd have to really fundamentally change and challenge some of those working assumptions about how households respond for us to really change our view materially. Okay, you can't be any more specific as to how massive the, the shift um, would need to be? No, I, I, I know, again, it's, it's too hypothetical to be able to sort of put um, sort of boundaries or, or sort of lines in the sands on these things. Okay. Um, did the bank factor in the likelihood of a Delta outbreak um, when it wrote the, the monetary policy statement? So just for people listening, the, state, the, the, the document is quite a long document and the bulk of it obviously was written before the outbreak, and then just the covering statement was written after we got news of the outbreak. Um, so the bulk of the document was quite hawkish. When that was written, did you think, okay, there's probably going to be a Delta outbreak? Not a specific Delta outbreak, but we did think about, well, what ha would happen if we were thrown into some version of lockdown again? So again, it's sort of a how long was a piece of the string, but the thought process was what we've learned is that when, you know, when economies are shut down temporarily to the extent that, that health response is contained and effective fiscal policies are reinstated, um, demand tends to bounce back. Um, balance sheets sort of are preserved through the worst of it. Um, businesses retain workers. Um, so spending ends up being deferred rather than lost. So as you talked about, demand, pent up demand gets released. Um, and if anything, what we've encountered and what we've um, realized is if anything, it's the productive side or the supply side of the economy, it tends to lag. So while spending and demand might come back, the challenges are often on the supply side. So the policy challenges that monetary policy are looking at right now has gone from worrying about shortfall in demand from 12 to 18 months ago to worrying about emerging capacity pressures and how those get resolved in the face of reasonably strong bounce back in demand once sort of those lockdown periods are ending. So that is quite a noticeable shift in the way we sort of think about the monetary policy challenge here and now. Okay. Um, Jung, this might sound like a really silly question, but what does the bank hope will be achieved by keeping the official cash rate at 0.25%? So is the bank trying to encourage people to take out more housing debt um, or to give, you know, uh, property owners uh, keep their mortgage repayments low? I mean, other than it just being a signal and sort of a symbolic, we're keeping it on hold, what is actually achieved by that when, as you say, the economy, uh, the air capacity constraints, inflation's rising, all those sorts of things? Yeah, well, I think if you look at the um, market pricing in the economy over sort of the past three months or so, I think we're getting a very clear read um, most people are getting a pretty clear read on, on how strong the economy is, um, emerging inflation pressures, the tight labour market, and hence the direction of monetary policy. So, 
sure, the OCR was left on hold. But if you read through the document and if you look at how people respond, people understand the direction that we're, we're likely to head into, you know, once sort of the, the immediate uh, uncertainty around this lockdown sort of plays out, um, you know, things can always change. We, we never say never, but from where we sit here and now and what we've learned, our starting point, um, it's pretty clear that we need to be removing some of the stimulus that we've been put in putting in place um, over the past 12 to 18, 18 months. Fiscal policy is doing the bulk of the heavy lifting um, to respond to COVID lockdowns. Um, but yeah, from monetary policy's perspective, it's probably about the direction of, of travel. Um, and that's probably the, the main thing to take away from it. Okay. Um, one of the ways that the bank has been stimulating the economy, we've got the OCR, people are very familiar with that, but there's also the funding for lending program. So this is basically the provision of um, low cost funding to banks. Um, with the idea that if banks get funding for cheap, they can only um, at low rates and don't need to worry about dropping term deposit rates. So this program is still there. The bank is still there saying, hey, banks will be money to you at a low cost, um, which is a stimulatory policy. Uh, I'm just wondering why the bank, whether the bank would think about removing that early. That's meant to be there until potentially the, the end of next year. Yeah, it is a great question, we, and we do get asked for it. But uh, and the important thing to remember is that funding for lending program, it, it is a contractual arrangement we put in place with banks. So the, the clear understanding is that this thing is is there to be drawn down until the end of 2022. Um, so all the the hard work of putting in place a program like that, you know, it, it's it we've basically got to maintain that. The thing for monetary policy point of view is that it's priced at the OCR. So to the extent that the OCR changes, um, it doesn't inhibit. The pass through of monetary policy at all. So when we looked at the effectiveness of, of the program, our obligations and commitments to the banking sector, um, basically we left it in place. Okay. Um, but, you know, does it remove the incentive for banks to kind of normalise the way they source their funding? And also, um, you know, this means they can keep their term deposit rates low, which encourages people to uh, invest in more speculative types of investment instead of putting their money in the bank. Like there are a few downsides to, to the program as well, is, is what I'm saying. Well, I think the most important thing is basically um, the, the transmission of policy primarily comes through the expectations of the OCR. We've made that clear that this is our preferred tool. We've laid out a pretty clear signal of where we like, we're like we likely to see that happening absent um, you know, a major downside shock. So you're already seeing the normal transmission of pass through to markets to pricing play out the way you would normally expect it to, you know, as we emerge from a, a low interest rate environment to potentially one where the OCR is rising over the future. Okay. The um, large scale asset purchase program, that's the bond buying or the quantitative easing, that's another tool that the bank has been using. Um, but as you just said before, the OCR is the favoured tool at the moment. And the bank has yet to drop a strategy around what it's going to do, how it's going to manage its balance sheet or manage all these um, about 50 something billion dollars of bonds four billion dollars of bonds on, on that balance sheet what can you give us in a, a bit of steer as to what that strategy might look like um not at this stage i mean basically we're we understand we've got a large holding of assets on our balance sheet um we've always said well we'd be guided by our sort of um, additional monetary policy principles as to what that means um what we're now signaling is um at some stage we will be thinking about how we manage the transition down um, and we're doing our thinking around what that looks like from an operational perspective. The key thing to remember is on the way down, you know, you sort of make a big splash about the large scale asset purchase program markets are dysfunctional, you want to keep interest rates low. Um, on the way out, you, you basically want to be quite methodical and almost wants to be operational and in the background. We're not sort of intending to send massive policy signals through the withdrawal of the LSAT program. We largely see it now as just managing down the operational, you know, the holdings of, of those, um, those assets on our balance sheet. Okay, so if you wanted to tighten monetary policy, you're not going to use the, the balance sheet to really um, spur on that tightening. So for example, sell off the bonds quite quickly to tighten things up if, if that is your monetary policy goal, that's where you're moving. Yeah, and the initial thinking is that's not our preferred approach. Um, as I say, we're still doing thinking on this, but the, the main reason we, we, we sort of sort of heading down this path is we know a lot more about how to calibrate tightening policy through an OCR. We know less about how you would do that through 
you know, selling down government bonds. Um, then you have operational aspects about, well, if the Reserve Bank's selling bonds, which to the market feels like we're issuing bonds back into the marketplace, and you have the Treasury or the government also doing the same thing, you know, what does that look like? So as you say, it's operationally, it's, it's trying to be as smooth and as efficient as possible. Main policy messages will be coming through an OCR path to the extent um, that we want to tighten policy. Okay, so are you worried that markets might not be able to absorb that many bonds because you'll have the government is still planning to um, issue quite a lot of bonds. I think it's $30 billion in the 2021-22 year. So the market's going to absorb that issuance and you're, you're not sure how the market might also absorb um, basically you selling these bonds back into the market as well. That's a lot of bonds. <laughs> Well, that's right. That's why that's why we want to be quite measured in how we think about it and then signal well in advance what our principles are that we're operating by so we don't surprise people <laughs> that suddenly we're going to basically flood the market with these bonds. Okay. All right. Look, um, the Monetary Policy Committee um, also said in its statement that fiscal policy, which is government spending, things like the wage subsidy, that type of thing, um, has proved to be a very effective tool to respond to any immediate reduction in demand in the event of an outbreak. Um, would the Reserve Bank feel more comfortable uh, hiking the OCR if, um, you know, once again, if we go into a long lockdown scenario, would it feel more comfortable hiking if the government brought on new uh, fiscal policy measures? So it's reinstating the wage subsidy and all of that, but if things got bad, if the government did something additional, would, would that mean that you can hike more quickly? Well, it comes, you know, again, it's, it's hypothetical. We just don't need to know well, what is the environment we're looking at. Um, so the, you know, the standard answer is, well, we'd look at what it means for our inflation outlook and our employment outlook. Um, so, and then we'd figure out what the appropriate stance policy needs to be to achieve sort of our inflation and employment remit. So it's not conditional specifically on, on fiscal policy per se, but the main message is we understand that fiscal policy has been hugely effective at shoring up confidence, shoring up balance sheets, shoring up demand such that when we come out of lockdown, um, demand returns quickly. Right. So the Reserve Bank has um, said in the statement that it, it thinks fiscal policy has proved to be effective. Is this something that it's actively um, talking to the government about as well, saying actually, um, you know, these targeted interventions, things like um, wage subsidies, but things that are targeted to, to certain people who need it, is these things are effective. Is this something you're, you're communicating to them as well? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It, it, there is a long-term question about the role of monetary and fiscal policy in sort of managing um, the economy. Um, I guess it's a live discussion. You know, we haven't spoken specifically about initiatives. It's more just a common understanding that to the extent that you have a fiscal, um, a wage subsidy program and other um, support measures roll, rolled back in quickly, like they were last time, we just understand how effective they have been at sort of holding up demand so that we take that into consideration when we're thinking about where the OCR should be set. Young Ha, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And I'm Jamaica, for interest.co.nz.